it was a week ago today that that the murders took place in Paris, and and it's an incredible coincidence that 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 I would be here at this time and be talking to you about another period in the history of Paris when Paris went dark, and um, and um, I wrote. Uh, uh, um, a lot of friends wrote to Betty and me and said, are you safe? How's everything? And I wrote an essay that um, um, back home uh, that was picked up uh, by my friends and, 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 and uh, transmitted. And um, I just want to read you one paragraph uh, as sort of a, um, in honor of those... Um, those journalists who were murdered for doing what, what all of us who write and, 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 and who explore history and who ask embarrassing questions uh, uh, try to do. I said that Charlie Hebdo was not a great newspaper. It was not a widely read one. Its most persistent impact came from the outrageous cartoons that its illustrators created and which were picked up by media all over the world. Nothing was sacred. Everyone's beliefs were criticized, and the paper's offices had been firebombed and its employees threatened. Most recently, the Weekly had been relentless in its targeting of radical Islam, or of those who use one of the world's largest religions for their own narrow purposes. In a formidable essay on Salon, Salon, which is a American website, Laura Miller writes that to kill someone for making fun of you is a tacit confession of your own impotence, a demonstration of the fragility of your self-respect and legitimacy. Yet this felt impotence and fragile legitimacy do combine to create murderers. Um, and I end by saying that thanks to, to countries like France, the light of reason will continue to show the rest of the world the way toward sanity. I felt it's important begin with this because in some ways my book is about the same thing, which is what happens when a familiar environment, um, familiar streets, the North Marais, streets you've all walked down, in fact we just ate in a restaurant not too far from the favorite restaurant of the, of the um, Charlie Hebdo um, uh, cartoonist, w what happens when suddenly it's changed? and becomes, it looks familiar, it seems familiar, it has the same names, but it's different. So what I tried to do in When Paris Went Dark is to write a, what I call a tactile history. That is, an, uh, showing how it might have felt for the occupied and the occupier to be on edge in a familiar environment for over four years. And this is very important to understand is that for most of for both the Germans and the French, they did not expect that occupation to last four years. Now we know it did because we have the benefit of historical um, uh, distance. They didn't know. As far as they knew, it was going to end in a year, in 16 months, if the Germans um, agreed with the French, uh, I mean, the, um, with the English, that war would be over, they could move troops out of France, etc. No, it, it lasted four years, which is a very, very long time. Um, the, my book has elicited challenging responses from professional historians. That's a polite way of saying a couple of bad reviews. <laughs> Because it doesn't explain so much as show, a show. And then I infer from a distance of, of um, three quarters of a century what it may have been like to have lived in occupied Paris. And I endeavored to give 
a tone of suggestiveness rather than certainty about such vexed questions as, should I resist? If so, how? Should I stay or leave? Should I accommodate and wait or collaborate and perhaps prosper? Where does accommodation fade and collaboration begin? Whom should I trust? Whom can I trust? And as the war goes on, as time passes, how do I adjust to its changes? So to distill possible answers from the memoirs, letters, diaries, and early histories I've read, the interviews I've had, and by the way, there's a gentleman here who was one of my first interviewees, Arnaud de Bonta, who taught, who explained to me in, in, in very moving detail what it was like to be a teenager in, in Paris during this time. Uh, it's very presumptuous for us to uh, judge, even to evaluate that period. Um, so, but given that fact, I think it's important that we must try again and again and again to understand what was a a, a remarkable um, um, historical uh, event that the French are still um, trying to work through. So what I'd like to do now is to read two passages from my book. Um, when I go to readings, I'm always bored out of my mind because I people get up and they read and I say, but I'm going to buy the book, I'll read it. <laughs> I'm much more interested in how you wrote it, why you wrote it, um, the reviews, um, are you ever going to write a book again after those reviews? Um, <laughs> and um, so I'm going to read two passages to give you a sense of, of, of what I was trying to do and then I'm going to open up the uh, the Florida questions, because quite frankly, I have spoken to, mm, I think, a dozen crowds. I spoke at the Smithsonian. I gave four lectures at the Smithsonian. I've spoken at Amherst College. I've spoken in New York. I've spoken in um, D.C. several times. Uh, the, the room is always packed. People are fascinated with this subject, A, because they love Paris, and B, because the this was a period that was... Um, uh, that that threatened Paris, and for the world, that the world stopped when the Germans marched into Paris, and that's where my title comes from. This is the this is the American cover of the book, which is a very subtle cover. Uh, the British cover, which you will buy. By the way, um, they said that Charlie Hebdo, the people of the kiosk, only selling one copy per person, because everyone's buying five, six, ten copies of Charlie Bill. I, uh, Shakespeare and Company have told me they will let you buy as many as ten copies. <laughs> uh, but I got this title from When Paris Went Dark, from that song that many of you will remember, by Jerome Kern and Oscar Hammer Hammerstein, which began, um, it's the last time I saw Paris. It was published in 1940, and it was immediately picked up. This is before the Americans were involved in the war, and sung by all the great singers: Kate Smith, uh, Dinah Shore, or Anne Southern. It was it was the most popular song from 40 to 41. The last time I saw Paris is still a beautiful song. I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, a, le a lady known as Paris, romantic and charming, has left her old companions and faded from view. Lonely men with lonely eyes are seeking her in vain. Her streets are where they were, but there's no sign of her. She has left the same. The last time I saw Paris, her heart was warm and gay. I heard the laughter of her heart in every street cafe. The last time I saw Paris, her trees were dressed for spring, and lovers walked beneath those trees, and birds found songs to sing. No matter how they change her, I'll remember her that way. I'll think of 
happy hours and people who shared them, and those who danced at night and kept our parish bright till the town went dark. And that's where I got the title, When Paris Went Dark. Um, so let me read two passages to give you a, an idea of what the book is about. How many of you have read the book? Okay. You all get an A. <laughs> you get an A plus. Oh, no. Rion. Very good. Was it good, Arnold? Because you have the good idea to send it to me. <laughs> you got a free copy, Arnold. But you have many grandchildren, don't you, Arnold? Yeah. Okay. In May, June 1940, as Germans raced to Paris, French and foreign Jews felt especially vulnerable. Most just stayed put, praying somehow that the French government and its Republican traditions would protect them from Nazi racism. But a few read the writing on the wall more astutely than others. One was a Jewish diamond mar merchant whose family had been French for generations and who was prescient enough to understand that not only was his business about to suffer, so were his wife and children as the Nazis instituted their racial policies in France. He had quietly procured exit visas for his family and had hired automobiles to drive them from Paris to the Spanish border and safety. One major problem remained. Border guards all over Europe had discovered how easy it was to demand bribes from fleeing Jews and other hunted persons. And the merchant knew that he would not be able to successfully carry his valuable stock of diamonds over the border. He had to leave them hidden in Paris, but where? Taking a rather w risky chance, he decided to rely on a friend, a soccer buddy from his lycée years, a Gentile. I should add here that I've heard this story personally from his son, and I, I, I met the gentleman um, uh, who's the subject of the story. The plan he devised was audacious. Heating up a large amount of lard-like unguent, he poured the mixture into a tall, clear jar, and then he dribbled the clear, precious stones into the liquid, constantly stirring them as they cooked. It was only this amount of stones, but it was a major, major gush. He dribbled the clear, precious stones into the liquid, constantly stirring it as it cooled so that the germ, germs, so that the gems would not settle to the bottom. Soon the concoction congealed, and from the outside the suspended diamonds were invisible. He arrived at his friend's home, holding the apparently innocuous bottle as if he were carrying a child. His friend welcomed him with the warmth he had he had expected. After they worried together about the current state of Paris and France, the diamond trader said, I must leave France for obvious reasons, and I'm unsure about when I'll be able to return, but I do know that I'd like to have this jar of a family remedy, an unguent for all that ails you, waiting here for me. It means a lot to my family and to our memories. Could I ask you to keep it? Bemused, his friend accepted the consignment, relieved, perhaps, that the request was as simple as storing a bottle in his house. The merchant left, unburdened but apprehensive, and he outsmarted himself, should he have told his friend what the jar contained. But more immediate concerns nominated. Fortunately, the merchant's escape with his family was a success. Making their way into and across Spain, they set sail from Portugal for the United States, where they remained for five long years. Around the dinner table, hundreds of times, their family wondered about that apparently innocuous bottle sitting in a dark cupboard back in occupied Paris. In early 1946, when our merchant could finally return to the city, 
He found himself once again in his friend's kitchen. For a while, they exchanged stories of the war. After a bit, the Jewish friend broached the subject that had preoccupied him for half a decade. Do you recall that jar of unguent I left with you in June of 1940? At first, his friend looked puzzled. Jar? Unguent? And then he remembered what had not crossed his mind since his friend had left. Getting up from the table, he rummaged around in a remote cupboard, mumbling, I hope we didn't throw it out when we moved things around during the war. The merchant politely weighted his guts in a knot. <laughs> ah, I found it, I think. Is this the jar? Oh, yes, the merchant answered, holding it once again as if it were a fragile Ming vase. Now I have a story for you. Could you light up your stove and get me a sieve and a pan? <laughs> and soon the contents of the jar were bubbling away over a low flame. Taking the sieve, the merchant poured the pot's contents into another container, and there, nestled in the mesh, was his diamond reserve, the gems sparkling as if they had never been covered with animal fat and salve. The grateful merchant selected the brightest, largest diamond from the pile and handed it to his speechless host. Take this one for your dear wife. Um, this is one of the happier stories that I found about what happened to the Jews uh, in this period. One of the most interesting things in my talks has been that in, in Washington and other places and emails I've gotten I've received a lot of emails from people who lived in Paris, and this one lady, must have been 85 or older, came up to me and said, I lived in, I'm Jewish, and I lived in Paris during the war, and I said, um, I, I said, how did you survive? She said, uh, nice Gentiles and good luck. And I've received other um, emails from, from people who want to tell me their stories. It's, it's, it's remarkable that we're right at the end of those generations, right at the end of the period uh, when people were old enough to remember what happened, and they're still out there, and they want to tell their stories. And this book, as I'm sure every book about the occupation does, uh, brings these uh, stories out. Now let me tell you about another story that's a little more... Um, amusing because uh, Charlie tells us to laugh. Um, one of the things the Germans did, they didn't want to change Paris. Of course, they changed Paris, but they didn't want the word to get out that they were changing Paris. They wanted to send uh, to the world the message that we are sophisticated, um, we are cultured people. So they left open the jazz, um, the cabarets, uh, the jazz venues. They let Django Reinhardt, a gypsy, perform um, in Paris while they were killing his relatives in Eastern Europe. Um, they kept open the bordellos. They made sure that all the bordellos stayed, and they, they, they were very careful because the Germans were obsessed with disease, so they were very careful that all these bordellos were very healthy, but they had, uh, they kept open bordellos, and uh, they, they ranked them according to who could go to them. Um, they had bordellos for enlisted men, they had bordellos for, for um, middle echelon military officers. They, they even had a bordello for SS officers, which must have been one of the more interesting bordellos. <laughs> um, and they kept bordellos open, they kept cabarets open, they kept jazz clubs open. Uh, that those clubs were um, like for the Folie Berger, where people would go and see uh, half nude women dancing. You see many photographs of Germans sitting there with their uniforms watching this. So Paris became sort of an anti-Berlin in a way. All this was forbidden in Berlin. It became an anti-Berlin, but it was a way of sending a signal, at least for the first two or three years, to both Britain and to the rest of the world that we're not that bad. Of course, underneath, they've already started their roundup of Jews and foreigners and socialists and, and everything else, but they were very canny 
about using the reputation of Paris to their benefit. Now, one of the most interesting, one of the most famous um, bordellos in, in Paris was at 122 Rue de Provence. It was known, it had been established in the early part of the 19th century, 20th century. It was known throughout Europe. All the, all of the people who counted went there. You know, princes and shahs and the Prince of Wales and everything. And it was known as one two two. They called it one two two. They called it saint It was one two two. And the madam of one two two, a marvelous woman, wrote a memoir that um, I found. It's out of print, unfortunately. It should be translated. And it should be put back into print because it's very, very good about one of the major aspects. Well, one of the things I talk about in my book is how sexualized uh, the occupation was in all kinds of ways. You may want to ask questions about that later. <laughs> so, one of the most humorous yet informative memoirs of the occupation was published by Fabienne Jamy. Brothel Madame par excellence, an owner and manager of 122, perhaps Paris's best known bordello. Cited at 122 Rue de Provence and the Chic et Arrondissement, it was known throughout Europe, not just as a bordello, but also as a meeting place for the city's cultural elite. Soon after its opening in the 30s, it had become the place where the upper crust Bohemian set gathered. On the first floor, there was an elegant cafe where drinks, especially champagne, were served to the sophisticated clientele, male and female, whether they were looking for sex or not. Most knew of the lavishly decorated rooms on the floors above, designed as harems, jungles, Roman baths, and so forth. As one climbed from floor to floor, the more refined the sexual offerings became. Having fled her business during the exodus in June of 40, Madame Jamais returned to find the bordello still operating, albeit filled, filled with German enlisted men, all wanting to taste one of Paris's most famous delicacies. She quotes, she says, the Germans had requis requisitioned the 122 and had installed themselves there the very day of their entry into Paris as if we had been as well known as the tomb of Napoleon at the Avalide. <laughs> and it's true, the Avalide, the tomb of Napoleon Avalide, was probably the most visited monument uh, during the four years. Rather than be relieved that the Germans had allowed her establishment to remain open and in business, Jamais was furious that this high-class establishment had been invaded by common soldiers, men who could never have afforded to patronize a place before the war. She marched down to the Rue Aubert, to the Place de l'Opéra, where the Commandantur de Grosse Paris had set up its offices. And there she asked to see a high-ranking administrator, and surprisingly, was quickly received. She ran a very high-class establishment, she told the bemused soldier bureaucrat. It was known throughout Germany and had even received many German aristocrats and businessmen before the war. She was appalled that it now would serve only enlisted men for her more respectable clientele would no longer come. This would be, she explained, a disservice to the occupation authorities themselves. Politely, the officer assured her that she would hear from his office within a month. We note that he did not jump up in Nazi horror at the degenerate culture of Paris and order her to find another profession. <laughs> a month later, she received a note stating that henceforth the 122 would be accessible only to German officers in uniform. At first placated, Jamie soon realized that this restriction would not provide enough income to keep her establishment in the black. Many officers came and bought champagne and hired her girls, but even though the officers seemed to be everywhere in Paris, they were not numerous or needy enough to keep her business afloat. So she returned to the commandant <laughs> to plead that Frenchmen as well be allowed to return to the bordello. 
The idea that German officers would be rubbing shoulders in a bordello with the Parisians, Parisians and French they were supposed to have under surveillance caused some consternation within the offices of the German authorities. Another month passed. Two Germans in civilian clothes, obviously Gestapo officers, appeared at the house's door and asked for Madame. They had arrived at a compromise. They told her French men would be permitted to come to the house, but only when accompanied by a German officer. <laughs> and this is a quote. And excuse the language, she said it, I did. <laughs> Are you joking, Inspector? Do you really think that every time one of my French clients wants to fuck, he is going to go up to a German officer in the street and say to him, Captain, will you go with me to 122? I want to get laid. If you refuse, I don't know what I'll do. This isn't serious. I'm ready to assume my responsibilities, but that goes for you too. At any rate, if you maintain this position, I'll just close. Four days passed. Another official letter arrived. Madame, from this day on, French citizens are permitted to enter your house. Officers of the German army may only present themselves in civilian attire. <laughs> 122 remained open during the occupation, and both German and French men enjoyed the offerings of Paris's most renowned bordello. So, um, I'll stop here because we have about 20 minutes, and I like I, it. This gives you an idea of what I'm trying to touch on is that I have a whole chapter in here, by the way, on what it was like to be a German, to be a, to be a um, German officer, to be a German soldier in Paris. Um, they felt sorry for themselves. Many of them, they thought they were lonely and the French weren't very polite. Okay. Can you imagine Parisians not being very polite? And, um, but it's true, and um, I have a, chapter on the on what happened to the Jews I have a chapter on on um, on how narrow the world became in, in this time on apartments question of food most of the people I interview I had to learn how to interview in a way I, I, I asked very awkward questions when I began interviews and I had to learn that you don't do that you have to just ask sort of wide open questions and then listen but one thing that comes over comes across over and over without a doubt is cold and hunger, cold and food. That's what you hear about, cold and food. Um, it, it happened to be, those four years happened to be some of the coldest years in the, in the 20th century of Europe. And, um, and the, the Germans were robbing France. They were taking everything. France was a very wealthy, rich, prosperous country. And they took they took every locomotive, um, every um, most of the train cars. They took most of the herds of cattle, all of the horses. They moved everything out into um, into Germany in preparation. In other in other words, to maintain German uh, lifestyle, which in a way kept the Germans supportive of Nazis much longer than we would think that they would have been given the, um, the, the horror of, uh, uh, of Nazi regimes. But the Germans were very careful, the Nazis were very careful to maintain a certain lifestyle, uh, which means they had to rob, rob, rob all the countries that they had, had invaded. So, it was an interesting, um, it's an interesting process that, um, and then I have a last chapter on liberation, who really liberated uh, Paris, because there's still a, some debate about it, on the, the on, on the Gaul, uh, whom I personally think is probably one of the one or two greatest politicians of the 20th century. Um, not that I wanted to meet him or anything, but he was a man of extraordinary um, political ability. He literally stood firm against Roosevelt, who despised him, and and um, and Churchill, who despised him on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and and um, he 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 did a massive job of, of reuniting a, a country that was split almost in a civil war. Um, anyway, I'll stop. So, thank you.
Now, I'll answer questions. Ed. Um, it's reinforcing and, and it's more personal. I, I got more, uh, although some, I, my written sources were, were memoirs that were written right after the war and they disappeared. There was a lot of writing right after the war, a lot of memoirs, a lot of uh, explanations, justifications, and then they disappeared um, in the five years, 45 to 50. So I went to the library and I found those and, and then you didn't find anything else for another 20 or 30 years. So I decided to talk to people who lived then, uh, primary uh, Gentiles primarily, you know, uh, uh, not Jews. Um, uh, and, and what was it like? And I, yeah, I, you know, what was what happened? And and I I heard food and darkness and hung and the cold. But when I pushed about, well, what did you think when you saw these signs? on the metro stations that so-and-so were killed as terrorists, that we have the Germans had executed 12 terrorists, all of whom had Eastern European or Jewish names for the most part. And they would respond, I thought they were terrorists. You know, I, I, the, 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 um, the hard, you know, we have, we can't judge what was happening at that time. We know now what was going on, but we can't judge it now. We don't know how we would act. We can't judge it. When I first started interviewing people, I thought I would just get information. Then I realized that I was getting, uh, I was getting um, psychological, uh, kind of, a uh, kind of, a uh, kind of psychology of memory as people were working there, I, I wasn't getting information. I was getting emotions and responses. I was hearing secrets that weren't being told. I, so so um, uh, I learned, I had a lot more respect for my friends who do interviewing, but it's hard. The French still have a difficult time talking about this. This, Yes, someone else. Yes, ma'am. Is your book going to be translated in French? Well, that's an interesting. I'm not going to give you my flip answer, <laughs> which is no. Which is no. Um, the Dutch. The Dutch. The, uh, she says, "Is my book going to be translated in French?" As of now, no. Um, the Dutch have bought rights, which I don't understand since they all read English anyway. Why do they want to print in Dutch? I don't, I don't even think the Dutch read Dutch. Um, but no, I haven't heard anything, so I don't know. What I am doing, some French writers have done. The French have written in the last 20 years, 25 years, a lot about the occupation. There have been books written about the daily, uh, the, the daily life, La vie quotidienne de l'occupation. There have been some good ones. The French have done it. Whether they need another book, the, the British have not been very generous toward my book. A couple of reviews said it's obviously written by an American, which I take it as an insult. <laughs> um, Europeans generally don't think that Americans understand Europe, so an American writing about the occupation of Paris is probably a little strange. I wrote the book primarily for Americans who don't know anything about the occupation, who don't know much about the French, except that the, except Freedom Price. <laughs> um, I was so sad to see the recent news about uh, attacks on Obama for not having showed up for the march, and I go back, and I'm a big Obama supporter, but I go back and forth on that, and I said, oh, God, well, couldn't he have sent somebody, you know? And then I realized how quickly that happened and how difficult it is to send anybody from the United States uh, over. And then I realized, you know, this was a European thing. I think it was good that, although you had a few Middle Easterners there and those great defenders of liberty like the Turks and the Hungarians, they were. Uh, but, uh, but um, the Americans are com have complicated um, views of France. And so I, my book was aimed at Americans. 
And they've responded very well. I must say the book is in its fifth printing already. Of course, there's only 40 copies in every print. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, you mentioned the goal, and I think Americans have a very ambivalent attitude towards this. I would say somewhat well, ambivalent. They had prepared a way for the French entry into Paris. They made the decision that they would let France come into Paris in the interest of French pride. But of course, the Americans had prepared the way. Right. And I think it was a couple of days before he spoke at the Hotel de Ville, he had a great interview with Eisenhower, and he said, listen, in order for me to support my authority, can you lend me two divisions? And I thought, yeah, Eisenhower said yes. And I think it was a little bit, um, I think, disrespectful for de Gaulle not to have mentioned the Americans at all when he gave the great address. Well, he did. He casually mentioned our no chers alliés. Uh, he he carefully mentioned that, but De Gaulle had a uh, Eisenhower did not want to liberate Paris. It was only two or three days before Paris was liberated uh, that he decided he didn't want to tie up all those troops, feed a city of two million. They wanted to get to um, they wanted to get to the Rhine and end the war before Christmas. That was Eisenhower's view, and. Um, and um, the French, the deuxième um, division blindé, in effect, um, jumped out ahead, and they had to support him after a while. Uh, uh, de Gaulle was, so I don't know who was right. I think that the liberation of Paris was a great, great, great boost to the world about the end of the war was coming when Paris was liberated. I think that if we'd gone around Paris and just gone straight to Berlin, my view is that um, we were still won the war, of course, everything, but the liber and, and irony is that Rome was liberated one day before Paris. It was liberated one day, but no, I take that back. Rome was liberated one day before June the 6th. It was liberated June the 5th. And so Rome did not get any of the credit, the liberation of Rome did not get any of the credit that it should have gotten because June 6, of course, took over uh, all the news. But these were major, these were major propaganda successes. But um, de Gaulle threatened, he blackmailed, he blackmailed Eisenhower. He said, we're going to have, you're going to have a, a civil war in Paris, and you're, I'm going to call for an insurrection, and you're going to have to back up and go attack He blackmailed him. That's why I really have to admire him uh, for doing that. I really have to admire him, but he was petrified of the communists. He was absolutely petrified that the communists were going to take over, or someone else besides him. <laughs> yes. Am I insulting anyone? Just let me know if I'm insulting you. If I say anything, where's my friend Philippe? Philippe Rochefort, who I've known for 40 years, lives, and, and every time I'd write something, I'd send him a chapter and say, how did I do? Well, you were okay, he say. Uh, you were fair to the French. That made me fun. So Philippe, just stand up and go, no, 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 yes. 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 I should have put an ad in that paper, but I think if I had done that, I would have had the response I've had since the book coming out, people writing me out of everywhere, and I would have had to find out, can I use your story and everything. So, friends who's like the, the story of the diamond merchant, the close friend of mine, that was his father. Um, I had a good friend uh, who introduced me to his father. I know the bon said so he lived there. So that's the way I did it. Philippe Rochefort's mother, I think, was the first person I asked. I said, I, I just got friends who lived during that. I'll show you how shameless I was. Anyone who, who I, I, I remember what um, the de Bontemps had, had me to their chateau uh, one, one summer, and he had a party, and there were a lot of men of his age there, and I had great stories in talking to them. One of them said something I'll never forget. He said, you know, everything would have been fine if, if Pétain and de Gaulle had shaken hands at the end of the war. I didn't know what to say. That I just said, do you play bridge? 
Um, but to show you how shameless I was, about three years ago, I was in front of a, and my custody, I was in front of a, a post office, and this lady uh, of a certain age was coming out, a beautiful uh, fox or mink coat on, and she was carrying this huge box, and she tripped. So I ran over and I grabbed the box and I grabbed her arm, and she said, "Oh, now see me, see me, see me." And I said, "Can I accompany you to your apartment?" And I'm praying that she didn't live fifteen miles away. And she said, "Yes, certainly." And so she takes my arm. I'm carrying her box, and we're walking along. And she says, "Vous êtes américain?" Oui, je suis américain. Beaucoup les Américains. Ils nous ont sauvé les Américains. I was saying, "Oui, oui, oui." <laughs> And so, uh, as we're walking, I say, what the hell? I'm going to interview her. <laughs> I'm going to ask her about Dr. Patient. So I said, Madame, vous n'est-ce pas, vous étiez à Paris pour nous occuper? Oh, oui, monsieur. Mais c'était triste, monsieur. C'était triste. Ah oui, comment c'était triste? Est-ce que vous avez rencontré les Allemands? Oh, non. Non, pas les Allemands. Uh, mais uh, she told me, il n'y avait pas de charbon. Il n'y avait pas de nourriture. On mangeait les navets. She said, "There's no, there's no, um, there's no food. We ate turnips, rabbits. Uh, it was terrible. It was cold. So every time I'd ask her a little leading question, I'd like, did you live in a big apartment? How did you have? I didn't dare ask her if she had Jewish friends because immediately she would have stomped on my foot and taken her package and run. But the." Uh, that's what I did. Sometimes I, I was really tactless. But most of the people I interview were people who, who, who gave me good bona fides. So, but being an American, they were very patronizing. Americans don't understand what it was like. You've never been occupied. I said, I'm a Southerner. <laughs> I said, the first 20 years of my life, I was told that we were occupied by the Yankees. I said, we understand occupation. Did you also interview people who made the choice of escaping Paris during the occupation? Let me ask the second one. The only one I, I, I there may be some others. But the, the one I um, interviewed, without a doubt, uh, and he was this gentleman, this uh, diamond merchant, he was smart enough, Jew, French Jew, who was smart enough to get his family out, which is very rare. French Jews were convinced they were safe. Um, Jews had come from the East, or recently, uh, recently nationalized Jews um, would be okay, but French Jews, whose fathers fought in the First World War, and in the Franco Persian War, they would be safe. And many of them stayed. And he, few families were just, I don't know what they did, but they read, you've heard these stories, and the same thing happened in Germany. They read the tea leaves, they wanted to get the hell out. That's why I get a little, um, um, how shall I put it, I'm a little um, skeptical about. Uh, about people saying they want to leave France now and go to Israel because of um, anti-Semitism. Um, there will always be anti-Semitism, and there will be anti-Semitism throughout Europe. There will be all be anti But it, 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 comparing this anti-Semitism to what was to this racial policy, not only of, of Germany, but of many European states, is just like comparing not even apples and oranges, like it's, it's apples and unicorns. Um, so, um, I totally forgot your question. What about me? Uh, what did I learn about me? Well, first I learned that I could completely do research in a field I knew nothing about before I started. My field is eight, I was trained in most of my publications, my teaching, graduate school teaching, everything was 18th century French and, German, and um, English literature. I wrote books on Marivaux, on Marclos, that beautiful period of Fragonard and Boucher, pinks and blues and, <laughs> and sweet sex. And, um, and I became an administrator, and, um, and I said, I don't want to do that anymore. I'll find something else. So I started teaching courses on Paris. 
since I'd been coming here since I was in my 20s. And, and uh, it just dawned on me, what was it like to live in my favorite city when it was, it looked the same, but it wasn't the same. So I learned, and it's something you should all keep in mind, that at the advanced, at an advanced middle age, you can do different things and write different books and explore. And uh, that's been the most exciting thing. The second most exciting thing has been the response, uh, the personal responses I'm getting from people. Did any of the people you interviewed somehow have a positive opinion of German soldiers or Nazis? Uh, but you have to make distinction between Nazis and Germans. A lot of the uh, soldiers in the United States were not Nazis. <laughs> They were Germans. They were fighting for the fatherland. They were not Nazis. The Nazis, no. I didn't have many people tell me, what a nice Nazi. I really met him. <laughs> um, the Germans, yes. A lot of the young boys coming here, a lot of the Germans. There are many stories of that. Of course, there were something like 250,000 young babies born in those four years in France from uh, girl, French girls and, and, and German soldiers. Um, and there were there were many love affairs. I mean, these were innocent kids who were just shoved into into this area. Um, so um, I, I've tried to make that distinction in my in my book between Nazis and Germans. My editor kept saying they're all Nazis. I said, no, they're not all Nazis. There were a lot of Germans who weren't Nazis. We have to make that distinction. So um, well, you said something else that made me think of something. Um, what was it before you mentioned Nazis and Germans? You, Albert Speer. Albert Speer is a fraud. <laughs> is that enough? <laughs> Albert Speer is a brilliant man, a beautiful writer, did a lot of stuff. But uh, tell me, you know how many Germans wound, wound up in the um, West German government afterwards? How many German Nazis we brought over to America to help us beat the communists? I mean, so many of these people put on their chameleon outfits in order to fit as good Germans, good Nazis. Oh, I didn't. I was an artist. Hitler was a whore. Uh, I had to do it. Fraud. He's fascinating, got an enormous amount of information, and fascinating to read him. But, you know, uh, this, this, this good German thing. There were a lot of good Germans, a lot of courageous Germans who died viciously, uh, and especially at the end when they, the, the, the Wehrmacht really just had it with Hitler and tried to kill him, almost did. Uh, but this idea that there were that these men who wound up, they wound up in major positions in the Bonn government. And we imported a lot of them, and they were our scientists. When did your interest in this project begin? Um, Fifty years ago. <laughs> when I first came to Paris, maybe it's a little less than 50 years, and I walked down the streets of Saint-Germain-des-Palais, uh, and they're all gone now. But you can still see the bullet holes in the uh, major buildings that they replaced most of them. You can see them in the Ecole Militaire. They left them at the Ecole Militaire, but I saw the bullet holes. And, and, I had, and the war had only been over 15 or 20 years. And, um, and I said, hmm, Germans fighting, Germans in power. That's when it started. But then it, it you know, sort of, it, it, it became more interesting once I started teaching this course on the history of Paris. What had what Paris, Paris is a bloody city. It's gone through many bloody revolutions, going all the way back to the to you know to the Fronde, to the to the Protestant um, the, the the wars of religion, and to uh, the the um, the revolution and everything. It's a bloody, bloody, bloody city, and um, and I I I, th I found that fascinating because it has. It has presented itself as a center of kind of a, a center of, a, 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 of aesthetic, aesthetic excellence and ideal urban environment. And yet its streets have run with blood for centuries. And this was another example that came, uh, it continues, May 68, and then these riots we've been having in the last 20 years, etc. But the streets ran with blood during the occupation. Ran with blood. 
but they dripped with blood. How's that? There were uh, there were a lot of murders and there were a lot of killings and um, and and during the liberation they ran with blood, mostly French blood, because the French killed French. More French, I think, were probably killed by by French uh, during the liberation and after the liberation than Germans. Germans wanted to get the hell out. They didn't want to. They wanted to get the hell out. But right in the course of your interviews, did you come across any Germans who had taken part in occupying Paris? It would have been marvelous. I would have loved to have done that. And, and what's, unfor you know, what's unfortunate is that a lot of those uh, fires are being, uh, it used to be you could buy, um, the Germans provided with uh, every soldier with a little uh, album and a camera and told them to take pictures of, of every country they were in. And I, I know a man who bought a lot of those on the internet in the 70s, now they're being destroyed. No one wants the world to know that their grandfather was an occupier or a Nazi or a member of the Wehrmacht. That stuff is disappearing. I just hope the Germans are smart enough to pick up on some of those. Um, um, on, there are a few uh, of some of the, and I did find some um, of some of those uh, uh, memoirs of what it was like to arrive in Paris, and there were a couple of very good ones. And, and, and what was it like to go out in Paris? Do I wear my uniform or do I not wear my uniform? And maybe if I speak French, I think I'm from Alsace, and they are. They, and the, and the French were much nicer to the Viennese than they were to the Berliners. They were much nicer to the Austrians because they felt the Austrians were more their cousins. What was the reaction to your book when it was published? I got this letter about a month after my book was published, and it's written handwritten and by a man and I looked him up because I looked his dress up and, and, and he lives in a, um, being a researcher, I looked it up on Google and <laughs> he lives in a retirement home and he says, regarding the liberators of Paris, you quote de Gaulle's entire speech where he says the French army liberated Paris. That is a perverted and accurate, arrogant statement. <laughs> and you, who is not sure who really liberated Paris, you are a, and he has a blank line. <laughs> the GI in the 29th Division and other U.S. divisions who landed at Omaha Beach and had 30%, 36% casualties, they liberated Paris. Without their efforts, Paris would not have been free. The French Army's contribution was minuscule and not crucial. I served as an officer with the men who liberated Paris 29th Division, signed A. Girard. P.S. Yes, I enjoyed your book. <laughs> and I have, and this is the touching part, and I have dual citizenship, U.S. and French, and my father worked for Vichy, and I was not proud of him. 